Bonjour tout le monde. Hello everyone. Je suis extrêmement heureux de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour cette nouvelle conférence virtuelle de l'initiative IA et Société et du Brockman Klein Center. I am delighted to welcome you today for a new virtual event co-hosted by the AN Society Initiative at the University of Ottawa and the Brockman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. For those who don't know me, my name is Florian Martin Barreto. This year, I am a fellow at the Berkman Klein Center, and I am also an associate professor of law and the university research chair in technology and society at the University of, of Ottawa, where I notably lead the End Society Initiative, for which uh, we, we hosted a, a series of conversations to discuss the ethical, legal, and policy issues raised by the development and deployment of AI systems. And the Brockman Klein Center, of course, I've also been very active in, in the space and in fostering such conversation. And I'm really delighted that we're able to partner for, for today's event. So for our conversation today, I am very happy to, to be joined and very I'm delighted uh, to be joined by uh, Faith uh, Magicology, uh, Michael Geist, and Ruth Okidiji to discuss corporate issues and recent recent developments around the world regarding text and data mining. To briefly present uh, our speakers uh, today, so Dr. Faith uh, Magicology is a fellow at the Buck McLean Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University and an assistant professor in the Faculty of Law at the University of Alberta. Dr. Michael Geist is the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-commerce Law and a full professor in the Faculty of Law Commerce Section at the University of Ottawa. And uh, you will also hear from uh, Dr. Ruth L. Okodigi, who is the Jeremiah Smith Jr. Professor of Law at Harvard Law School, and who is also a co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. We will start our event with uh, short presentations by our speakers, and I will then uh, facilitate a conversation uh, with our guest. I invite uh, attendees with us today to use the Q&A function uh, of the webinar to ask uh, questions that, that you may have, and I will uh, look at those questions and ask them to our guest. So uh, thank you again, uh, everyone, for being uh, with us today. And without further ado, I will uh, give the virtual floor to uh, Professor uh, Magical Thank you. Thank Good day, you. everyone. Thank you for coming to this event. I would like to start off by providing a context for today's discussion on copyright, text mining, and AI training. In an age where the application of computer algorithms, large computing power and tools, and AI volume, velocity, and variety of data generated in digital form collide, whether perfectly or not so perfectly, it's actually not surprising that computer scientists and technologists devised a way of applying computer algorithms to large data sets for data processing, discovery of information and knowledge. In the last couple of years, text mining and AI training have become ubiquitous terms as many technological developments have been based on the automated analysis of text and data to generate valuable information and to make machines intelligent. In the EU Copyright Directive on Digital Single Market, text and data mining was defined broadly as uh, any automated analytical technique that was aimed at analyzing text and data in digital form in order to generate information. And this information could include uh, patterns, trends, and correlations in the analyzed data. Uh, text and data mining is necessarily an activity that also occurs in AI training because AI systems or machine learning models train on large data sets that, that are mined uh, to generate information and to generate knowledge that are used to make machines intelligent. Uh, you'll agree with me that text mining has become much more pervasive in the era of AI and Internet of Things as digital systems generate, record, and process data to facilitate interactions between interconnected devices and also now interactions between humans and machines. Internet search engines and virtual assistants like Siri and Alexa mine data from the web and other sources to provide outcomes to our search queries. 
generative AI tools like ChatGPT are made possible by the availability and the mining of large data sets upon which these language models are trained. Researchers, especially those in digital humanities and biomedical sciences, are also now employing text and data mining techniques to analyze and process a wide range of data to derive information and insights that could be useful in solving key research challenges in the areas of health, agriculture, climate change, and many more. Given the relevance of text mining and AI training to research and innovation, it is not surprising again that scholars and even policymakers are concerned about the potential of copyright law to stand in the way of these activities. Now to the crux of our conversation today, how does copyright really interface with text mining and AI training? Now, when text mining and AI training activities involve the use of works that are protected by copyright law, in data sets, copyright may be implicated. Copyright law grants the copyright owner the exclusive rights to the reproduction, distribution, telecommunication, and adaptation of the work. In essence, copyright law prohibits the doing of this act without the authorization of the copyright owner. And CDM activities and AI training would necessarily involve the reproduction of works that form the basis of the data sets to which these algorithms are applied to train AI systems or to derive information from large data sets. Quite simply, there can be no TDM activity, AI training, without the use of copyrighted materials, whether these materials are in the form of text, images, sounds, or visuals, or a combination of any of this. And the mere fact that you know these materials are readily available that is without paywall on the internet or in a library but that is really obviates the need for permission unless a negotiated license or an open license has been granted by the copyright owner or the legal exception permitting the exploitation or use of this work without seeking permission exists in the relevant copyright law uh, without a negotiated license or an open license or an exception permitting the reproduction or even the adaptation of uh, works for text and data mining purposes and AI training purposes, uh, copyright law could be implicated, even if these works are readily accessible on the internet. And even for works that are readily accessible on the internet, there could be digital logs. Uh, uh, you know, scientists, technologists would have to circumvent to make productions and even adaptations possible, thereby again implicating and circumvention um, provisions in copyright laws. Now, while the computational analysis and processing of digital or digitalized content to generate and synthesize information, whether this information that is being generated by this uh, computational analysis are right or wrong, or they are even doubtful, uh, the use of these computational techniques have become commonplace today, and people are quite amazed about uh, the potential of AI. But as it is, countries are still grappling with how to react to this development in the light of the use of in copyright works for text and data mining and AI training activities. Now, jurisdictions like the EU, Singapore, UK, and Japan have reacted to this copyright and text mining interface by making legislative changes in the form of text and data mining exceptions to their copyright laws. And these exceptions either allow the use of um, works in text and data mining for both commercial and non-commercial purposes, provided the use would be non-expressive uses, or sometimes just allow the, uses of, the use of these works for non-commercial or research purposes. And these are just a handful of countries or jurisdictions that I have reacted to uh, the text and data mining and copyright interface. The majority of countries, however, are still struggling to decide whether the use of copyrighted works as inputs for text and data mining and AI training activities implicate or should implicate copyright laws. Now, part of this stance in deciding on the use on, on this particular issue is not unconnected with the implications of any decision that is made by a country for innovation, especially for the development of AI and um, other frontier technologies. Also, the volume of works involved in text and data mining and AI training activities 
make it more, makes it more challenging to decide whether obtaining permissions for the large range of copyrighted works involved uh, and for works that are already readily accessible is feasible and even necessary. On the other hand, we also have concerns that the unlicensed use of works constitutes a theft of the intellectual labor of others who are often neither acknowledged nor remunerated for the use of their works. Oftentimes, it is in fact even impossible to acknowledge the authors of works that form the basis of text and data mining activities and AI training activities. This concern is even more heightened when AI training activities culminate in the development of generative AI tools like ChatGPT, because these tools could be commercialized and could even lead to the exclusion of those whose works form part of the training data for the tool. So on the one hand, they are not being remunerated for the use of their works, and on the other hand, uh, they have even been excluded from the use of these tools uh, because access barriers are being developed. Now, the question remains whether the copyright owner must be given control over or remunerated for all forms of exploitation of their works. This has been uh, a question that keeps coming up in copyright law. Should we remunerate the copyright owner or should, we, or should we give control to the copyright owner over every form of exploitation of their work? Or are there certain forms of exploitations that should be excluded from the scope of uh, the exclusive control of the copyright owner in the best interest of the general public and whether, you know, use of work for text mining and AI training activities should fall within the scope of uh, such acts or exploitations that should be excluded from the scope of copyright uh, protection in the best interest of the general public. Now, while this question has not been answered one way or the other in Canada, in the context of text and data mining and AI training, there are suggestions that to the extent that TDM and AI training activities involve lawfully accessible works on the internet or lawfully accessible works in libraries, that such activities, um, you know, the unlicensed use of works for such activities should be covered under existing copyright exceptions, especially when those activities do not lead to the communication or the distribution of the old or a substantial of the copyrighted works that form the basis of the um, data corpus. Now, uh, most commentators have relied on section 29 of the Canadian Copyright Act, which uh, provides the fair dealing for the purpose of research, private study, education, parody, or satire does not infringe, uh, does not infringe on copyright in Canada. However, even in reliance on this particular section uh, to justify unlicensed use of copyrighted works remain very unclear, especially because unlike the United States, Canada adopts an exhaustive list model, which means unless um, the fair dealing activity uh, is for any of these purposes or, or for the other two purposes in section 29.1 and section 29.2, that is criticism and um, misreporting, uh, it could not be covered on that federal provision in Canada. And so whether uh, every text and data mining activity or every AI training activity would necessarily be interpreted to um, amount to research activities remains unclear, even in the light of Supreme Court of Canada decisions that we should give a uh, large and liberal interpretation to the word research and to federal purposes. But it still remains unclear whether the Supreme Court of Canada would be willing to actually give such an expansive interpretation to the word research for the purpose of text mining and AI training, especially for those that um, are not involved in traditional research um, activities. Now in 2021, Innovation Science and Economic Development Canada, ISED, ISED called for insights into copyright and related issues surrounding text and data mining and the use of copyrighted works training data for development of AI systems. While the consultation period has since ended, the copyright issues are yet to be resolved by means of legislative interventions, as there appears to be a desire to promote AI and text and data mining on the one hand, and to remunerate authors for works used in the course of these activities on the other hand. Now, whether both can be achieved in Canada remains to be seen, but the relevant question is, how do we ensure that copyright law does not stand as a barrier to innovation in Canada? 
Now, in the context of African countries, uh, rights issues arising from text and data mining and AI training are also beginning to be raised, uh, notably in the recent proposal by the African group, so the Standing Committee on Copyright and Related Rights at the World Intellectual Property Organization, was adopted uh, in March 2023. The African group actually urged the SCCR to consider facilitating a discussion and exchange of views on limitations and exceptions for text and data mining research. Now, while the inclusion of text and data mining, limitations and exceptions for text and data mining research in this proposal suggests a desire by African countries to ensure that copyright does not actually stand in the way of text and data mining activities in the region. The restriction to text and data mining research as this, this uh, aspect of text and data mining activity, just text and data mining research, actually reflects a cautious hesitation in African countries to dabble into the waters of exceptions and limitations for text and data mining and AI training activities. Now, African countries are interested in the potential of TDM activities on solving some of the key challenges of the continent and in also advancing research and innovation on the continent. However, they are also concerned about the possibility of you know, their knowledge being mined and used in the creation of technological and knowledge goods that may eventually be inaccessible to them. And these concerns are very valid uh, in the face of colonialism, but also not only in the face of colonialism, but also in the face of uh, continued misappropriation and misuse of uh, cultural heritage, traditional knowledge and generative resources that are gotten from uh, local communities in African countries. So African countries have valid reasons to really be concerned about the implications of text and data mining and AI training that rely on text and data that is generated within the region, used for technological activities outside of the region and used in the development of technological tools that are inaccessible to people within the region. But yet, they are also interested in what can be done in terms of you know, copyright norm setting to further text and data mining in the region, perhaps in ways that address their concerns. So um, even though African countries have these concerns, they also um, appreciate the benefit or the importance of text and data mining activities to research and innovation on the continent. So in today's conversation with professors with PDG and guides, and as ChatGPT and other generative AI tools um, reach on, I hope we would be able to discuss whether and how copyright should try to catch up. Thank you, everyone. I'll pass the virtual mic to Fumrin. Thank you so much, uh, Faye, for this presentation and to like explaining a bit all of the legislative forces uh, at stake and what's going on uh, around around the world. Uh, so maybe I will uh, invite uh, my co professor, Professor Geist, uh, to offer like some 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 comments uh, for like five to ten minutes. Sure. So yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thanks, Florian, and thanks, Faith, for a really great uh, presentation. Um, I, I, you know. I, well, I, I'm going to focus just expanding on a few things, especially from a Canadian perspective. Uh, but I want to start by saying that this feels like a, a really important moment when it, it comes to this issue. It, it in some ways feels to me almost like the this generation's uh, digital locks or any circumvention rules where we ended up with almost 20 years worth of debate around what felt like para copyright and and the and legal protections for for digital technologies and we saw how that unfolded both at WIPO and then in many other countries in the DMCA in the United States and um, Canada with the, the copyright modernization act and, and it play it's played out in many different places and it seems to me that we are uh, starting, I think, to see some of the, the same kinds of issues uh, begin to emerge and that this will, I think, have, have similar kinds of stakes, perhaps even bigger stakes, if we, if we think about the impact that AI is likely to have. There has been, at least in, 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 from my perspective, a pretty significant shift in the in the discussion, even around things like text and data mining, or as described at one point in time in Canada as an IA exception, an information analysis exception, from one that was viewed as seeking to facilitate AI 
looking where there was a great deal of excitement about what AI would bring and concern that copyright could create a significant barrier to AI achieving what many were hoping for, to I think what is now a case where some are looking to copyright to stop some of the AI development. Um, rather than seeking to embrace it, one gets the sense that there are increasing amount of fears about where AI is headed. We've seen quite literally uh, some AI leaders uh, talking about finding ways to sort of put a stop to, or at least a temporary halt to some of the development that we're seeing. And one gets the sense that that copyright may be used as a sort of cudgel here to, to try to facilitate some of that, uh, some of those barriers. And I think that's a pretty significant source of concern. Um, I'll, I'll turn to some of my specific views, I guess, once we get into a bit of the dialogue, but just to highlight a little bit how this discussion, I think, may be evolving, at least in Canada. Faith mentioned the, the consultation around text and data mining in Canada. I think it's fair to say that the way the Supreme Court of Canada has interpreted fair dealing consistently now for the better part of two decades, there's a pretty strong case that many of the kinds of uses that we see would still be covered by fair dealing. We've seen a full change in the court in terms of its composition, and yet the principles that the Canadian Supreme Court has adopted around users' rights, around a flexible interpretation of fair dealing, and the way they have uh, embodied that in a number of different cases, looking at some of the uh, purposes that, that Faith identified, suggests to me that, that, that there's, a, there's going to be at least a pretty reasonable case that many of the kinds of uses that might arise would be covered by fair dealing today. Um, that said, if you are engaged in the business of developing these tools, either at a research level, but even more on a commercialization level. And in Canada, we've started to see much more of an emphasis on some of the commercialization side. I, I put out a, a regular, almost weekly podcast. And my guest this week is Aidan Gomez, who is the CEO and co-founder of Cohere AI. It's a Canadian AI company is a sizable Google investment as part of it. Um, Aiden was involved uh, in the T in chat GPT and developing some of the transformers. And so um, it, it comes, I think, with, with, with a great deal of credibility in terms of where it's been moving. And that emphasis on shifting away from what was once, uh, in, from a Canadian perspective, leadership on the research side of AI to leadership on the commercialization side um, means that there will be more attention on what the legal frameworks look like. And it seems to me that if you're looking to invest um, millions, hundreds of millions, even billions of dollars, as we have started to see in some of these, it's, it's not good enough in many instances for some of those investors to say, well, um, we think that the Supreme Court might come up with a pretty reasonable interpretation of fair dealing. You know, it, uh, it, that becomes a bet the company kind of issue potentially. And so there will be many who will be looking for greater certainty. The, the consultation that, that Faith made reference to was part of a series of consultations that the government has launched around copyright. For those that kind of aren't familiar with our long processes associated with this, we spent the better part of about a decade battling over WIPO implementation leading up to reforms that took place in 2012. And over the last decade, there's been some piecemeal changes, some of them driven through by trade agreements. For example, we extended our term of copyright uh, due to the USMCA or Kuzma. Uh, so we've seen a bit of that, but there have been less of the larger kinds of reforms. This was put forward as one of them. But I have to say the cynic in me would suggest that if we look at some of the outcomes of those consultations and the willingness of the government to pay much attention to them, um, it's not clear to me that they're paying much attention, quite frankly. That certainly was the case with respect to copyright term extension. With respect to the text and data mining consultation and AI and the IA consultation, the informational analysis exception, you had you know, a, a wide range of perspectives. You certainly had, had a strong case made for the need for this kind of exception to provide that additional level of certainty. But I don't know that we've seen, at least so far, uh, a significant amount of uptake within government. It's possible that this will become uh, a priority, but it, it, there, there, we haven't been given, I don't think, a strong signal that this is something that we're going to get. And if, if it does come, um, it may come as part of a larger package that may raise its own set of issues in terms of where the government wants to head. Faith didn't spend much time mentioning it, but 
I, I, before, but I do want to mention that there is another piece of AI regulation that is currently being discussed in Canada. And I think it actually, the, the way in which it has begun to evolve highlights the, the likelihood that we will see an acceleration of this issue, although not necessarily one that seeks to uh, facilitate greater AI development and use, but rather potentially sees this as a, a mechanism to impede uh, some of that AI development, or at least um, sort of allow, allow some people to hit uh, cautiously the brake a little bit. Now, that bill is Bill C-27 in Canada, and it's a bill that has both uh, elements of privacy. In fact, it is billed primarily as a privacy reform bill, but there is separately a section that deals with uh, AI regulation. And the, it's a bill that has not moved quickly, although that seems likely to change, seems about to change. And it seems as if that a big part of that is, in fact, uh, the AI side of the equation. It's a piece of legislation, at least the AI provisions, that have not received um, Uni uniform applause. In fact, they haven't received much up until a few days ago, hadn't received much applause at all, quite frankly, many suggesting that the bill itself was more virtue signaling than actual regulation. It doesn't provide much in the way of specifics. And there is a long timeline for regulations and actually uh, providing a bit of meat on the bone, so to speak, in terms of providing some specifics. But I think in light of some of the the kinds of campaigns we've started to see around ChatGPT, and that includes, I think, some of the copyright elements, it's clear the government's paying attention. And just last week, the, well, the, the responsible minister, Francois-Philippe Champagne, held a, minister, had held a meeting of his AI task force. And as part of that, we've started to see just in the last number of days, uh, growing calls to move very, very quickly. I've talked to people who say the government may try to push this through by the summer. Um, and that's a piece of legislation that, that I don't think pr is, is really worthy of, of pushing through. There is, there is a need for, I think, some significant reform to it. But I put all of this on the table before getting into some of the substantive questions, which I'm, I'm, I hope we have the chance to do uh, as part of the upcoming discussion, just to highlight that the, the, the relevance of this and the speed with which, at least in, in, in Canada, it seems to me governments are beginning to, to, to turn their attention to this and be willing to regulate, I think, demands our attention for those that are interested and concerned with some of these issues. And that in many ways, the script has been flipped a little bit. And the role of copyright here may ultimately be, at least in the view of some pushing forward on these regulations, less about seeking to facilitate AI and more about looking for ways to constrain some of its development, copyright being identified as one of those means. I'll stop there and, and look forward to some of the additional discussion we'll have. Perfect. Thank you so much, Michael. And I will try to stay in my role of facilitator regarding AIDA. <laughs> Do not offer too many comments. <laughs> but so without further ado, I will uh, hand it over to uh, Prof uh, for for your comments. Thank you so much uh, to Faith and Florian and uh, everyone in the audience for um, this webinar and the opportunity, I think, to gather and really delve into some of the challenges that we're facing. I agree with Michael that we are certainly at a moment. This does feel like a moment in which the choices that we make um, will shape both the nature of the policy um, um, outcomes that we're likely to get and also influence the way that um, the subject matter of copyright in particular is likely to evolve in the face of these uh, large language models and uh, generative um, AI. I want to just say a number of things because I think the conversation is going to be very important in helping us think through this. First, um, whenever we we hit a technological um, uh, frontier, there are always the first movers. And the assumption in, in other fields other than law is that first movers have first mover advantage, that they can shape um, the outcome of the uh, debate, they can select um, what values or norms uh, we are likely going to advance, um, and that they can begin to make it hard for other countries in this sense um, uh, to do something different because the, there's always a pull 
towards harmonization. We saw this, of course, in the harmonization um, uh, battles um, in the uh, 1990s. We saw them in the uh, um, uh, digital locks battles that Michael has already alluded to, and I suspect that we're going to see them here. So we already have, as Faith noted, we already have early movers, um, the UK, the EU, uh, Singapore, um, really taking um, a statutory uh, measures to facilitate text and data mining. Uh, then we have uh, slow movers, um, but fast watchers which is where I would put the U.S. In other words, the U.S. watches what everyone else is doing, um, rarely moves legislatively as a first option, and, dis and, and tends to allow um, these issues to percolate um, through the courts. Now, that leads me to my first major um, uh, point, and that is the nature of copyright lawmaking. And while the system that we have in place, which involves a serious exercise in political economy, often requires bargains between competing interests um, and rarely um, indulges the careful reflection and, and slow deliberation that may be required. Uh, while that model may work in our favor, as Michael has alluded, uh, for those who may be interested more in restraining, um, the rapid development of AI, I just want to say that this model of copyright lawmaking is fundamentally flawed. And I don't think that the fact that we may benefit from it in one instance over another ought to cause us to overlook that we are dealing with a legal discipline that has deeply divided policy goals um, and deeply conflicted normative objectives. And we need to always ask the question, are we addressing the problem with the right tool? Is copyright law the appropriate place to have the battle over access to text um, and data mining? So that's the first question um, I wanna put on the table that making copyright law um, in a manner that um, facilitates decision-making without a clear sense of what the trade-offs are and where the technology might lead us um, may not still be the wisest option. It was not the wisest option when we handled duration. It was not the wisest option when we got the WIPO copyright treaty in its initial stages. Um, it was not the wisest option um, um, certainly as we are now looking at TDM and AI. So what does that mean? If, if, if this is the system of lawmaking that has now gripped not only the US, but Canada and Australia and, 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 and West African countries and South Africa, I mean, all over the world, copyright lawmaking is a contest about what we fundamentally think the right innovation policy ought to be. We have turned copyright rightly or wrongly, it is a measure of innovation. And so the battle over, do we do innovation through exceptions and limitations or do we do it through the exclusive rights remains very present even in an era in which um, access to publicly available um, information uh, is really what is generating um, the need for text and data mining, uh, attention to text and data mining. So the first thing, of course, is that text and data mining with works that are in the public domain presents no problem. You don't need an exception. You don't need uh, to, to fight at the policy table because the work is in the public domain. And so we have a tendency to ignore the old battles um, in favor of the new ones. But may I suggest that duration remains a problem. If the tension between TDM is over, do I get to freely access it to, to do my research or do I have to seek permission? Then it tells us that the length of duration of copyright duration remains a huge question which affects the scope of the rights that we are willing to give and also fundamentally affects the limitations and exceptions that we need. If we had shorter copyright duration, um, there are many more works injected into the public domain. If we had even tiered duration, where not everything 
is subject to the exact same uber long duration, we may actually have a more robust set of works in the commons on which text and data mining um, researchers can operate. So I, I want to be sure that we are not um, indirectly and unintentionally reframing the problem, that we have a fundamental problem with the duration of copyright and we need to think about what this means in an era of rapidly changing creative options, rapidly changing creative mechanisms and rapidly changing innovation frontiers that require large inputs of data in order to actually do the work of advancing the progress of science and the useful arts and enhancing human flourishing. That's the first thing. The second uh, concern that this um, um, highlights for me is the limits of limitations and exceptions. Every new possibility of scientific progress requires data. We are unavoidably and unchangeably and irrevocably in a data driven economy, a data-driven culture, a data-driven production system. If data is the basic input and we recognize property rights in data, and then we build on top of property rights in data, copyright interests, and then the only way we give keys to unlock the data is through limitations and exceptions. It means that for every innovative turn that requires access to data, we are dependent on this broken system of copyright lawmaking. We've got to go back to the Canadian Parliament. We've got to go back to Congress. We've got to do all of these things. Um, in the case of the United States, as you, as many of you know, um, the Authors Alliance um, uh, was able to uh, get a new exception to section 1201 of the DMCA to enable text and data mining research on eBooks um, and films. And so when you think about the transaction costs of getting these permissions to do the work that copyright was designed to do, to enhance knowledge, to promote progress, to build the commons, if every battle requires an exception, and that's the modality in which we become accustomed, then the very project of copyright law, I think is imperiled. And we ought to be thinking then perhaps of models that include unfair competition, models that include fundamental uh, rights to reverse engineer or to engage in cultural interchange, things that allow us to participate as a society in the data economy and to promote the advancement of research and progress in the useful arts. So I think we need to ask ourselves whether exceptions and limitations are becoming the default mode in which we advance the very goals of copyright and whether that is um, the kind of environment in which we think that text and data mining will most flourish. Um, remember that of course, when we're talking about text and data mining, we're talking about large scale computational analysis. This is an exception that needs to endure for the rest of our foreseeable future, because we're not going back on the way in which our economy is built on data for purposes of medical research, of scientific advancement, of, of learning and understanding new bodies of knowledge. There's no going back. So a 1201 DMCA exception that lasts for a certain number of years and we have to repetition, re repetition, um, or a, a, a legislation that is drafted fairly narrowly that very quickly outlives its utility for scientific research. The question is, are we, are we really uh, being pound wise and penny foolish or penny foolish and pound wise? And so I want to challenge this, and I want us to think about this as we engage with policymakers and engage with lawmakers about what makes sense for the kind of economy that is built on large data sets for which the inputs may or may not be subject to copyright protection, but clearly 
we have challenges with inputs and we have challenges with outputs. And it strikes me that limitations and exceptions work very differently if you're thinking about an input versus if you're thinking about an output in the context of AI um, training, for example. So that's a second major point that I want to make. The third um, that I want to make on, on top of duration is that one of the challenges we have faced with text and data mining, consider the EU um, exception. Um, in a paper that Tom Margoni and uh, Martin Krishna have written, they point out the, the in, inherent biases in the way in which the EU text and data mining um, exception exists. So only certain individuals get to exercise that exception. In a world in which we are often concerned about um, discrim discrimination um, and downstream innovation and ensuring uh, a, a small and local, uh, small and medium enterprises are able to compete in this market. The idea that we would distinguish in an inartful way who can use this exception and who can't already tells us that the exception and limitations mode, in addition to being not the best way to do policy, also has um, an inherently, uh, an inherent potential to be discriminatory. So who's at the table? Who gets to use the exception? Under what circumstances is the exception, um, in fact, um, uh, allowable? And that then, of course, brings me to the third point about fair use, the fourth point about fair use. So to, to, to Michael's point, um, we're seeing that fair use is flexible. Fair use certainly allows us uh, um, um, to, to uh, engage in uses with a zero royalty rate. In other words, it's at your risk. You, 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 and I think obviously um, um, fair use is um, in a way a, a policy tool that gets its greatest effectiveness because it doesn't operate as a property rule in, in many ways. It's a liability rule. You, you essentially go in, you use it, and then you figure out after the fact whether or not it is um, uh, legal. My question is whether given the promise of text and data mining for large language models, given the promise um, of AI, do we, do we want to rest on the uncertainty that pervades the more flexible approaches to limitations and exceptions? So as much as I am a fan of, of, of fair use, and um, we of course have the Warhol case um, uh, before us, I, I question whether even in the context of TDMs, whether what we um, want is the uncertainty and the instability that can permeate ad hoc case-by-case -case determinations of whether or not the exception is in fact allowable in a particular context. My sense is that as a matter of innovation policy, this is likely not the sustainable outcome um, that we might want to use. And my last point really um, is the question of how we might reimagine um, a text and data mining exception that isn't a victim of the instability and the uncertainty that marks fair use that isn't subject to repeated efforts of renewal in the DMCA style manner. Um, and that isn't subject to a narrow um, definitions in a way that actually limits who can use it and who can access it. And, and so one, one possibility is, should we be thinking about a sui generis regime? as opposed to exceptions and limitations, as opposed to fair use, as opposed to DMCA uh, uh, rulemaking authority, should we be thinking about something fundamentally different that allows the experimentation, that precludes the discrimination, and that facilitates the kind of innovation that AI and text and data mining um, practices suggest is right at our very fingertips. And I'll stop there. Perfect. Thank you so much for those thoughtful uh, comments. We have uh, a lot of questions from from the audience. I also took like so, so many uh, notes when like the three of you were like um, speaking. But maybe uh, first, uh, I would like to maybe offer the opportunity to to Faith uh, to to reply to those comments or like offer some more like you no know, thinking uh, based on what you ju just heard. Uh,
you can mute. Please. Do you want me to pick a random question? No, no, no. You, if you have like comments and thought on about what uh, Ruth and Michael just uh, just said, and then oh, okay. I, I will ask a, a few questions. Yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Geister and uh, Professor Kijik. Um, um, I, I mean, I haven't quite thought of the fact that what's really up me now, especially with you, since we serve Canada, is like a reversal of the role of corporate law. Using copyright law to restrain that to, to restrain development uh, in AI, and um, that's quite interesting because uh, what that would do is it would lead to the expression of the exclusive rights that copyright owners have over the exploitation of copyright works, and again, uh, takes us to a place where we takes us to a place where we end, we end up with a system that is more rigid. Uh, than the system we had going into consultation or discussions relating to uh, copyright AI and uh, data mining. And also to uh, refer to Professor Kedigi's points relating to you know, the limitation or the restriction of exceptions and limitations as uh, tools for facilitating access to data sets um, for lang large language uh, modeling and also other AI and text and data mining mining related activities. And I agree that we, we may need to start thinking about sui generis systems. We, we may need to start thinking about the limitations of exceptions and limitations. And also particularly because most exceptions and limitations facilitate use, but not necessarily facilitate copies. And uh, text and data mining activities necessarily involve the making of copies um, that are being mined or that are being, that are being used to train um, AI systems, and also copyright laws or intellectual property laws uh, so far have tried to be kind of neutral when they necessarily should not be. So in the context of, say, discrimination or AI bias, um, if we rely on just copyright exceptions and limitations, they would not necessarily, they would necessarily be neutral to all of the bias and discrimination that are attached to the use of, uh, you know, inadequate data sets or non widely representative data sets. So I agree that dealing with the issues relating to AI, we, we need to look beyond copyright law and uh, perhaps we're asking copyright law to do much more than uh, it is it is capable it is capable of doing. And also uh, to both Professor Geist and Professor Kedigi's comments uh, relating to you know fair use and fair dealing provisions, which first flexibility and uh, which we could say that in the US or in Canada we could rely on fair dealing to justify um, you know these AI activities, but businessmen um, or persons engaging in these activities for commercial purposes require lots of certainty to actually go into project, this project. Even uh, researchers who are going to be engaging in what million dollar projects want a level of certainty going into this project and relying on, rather than just rely on, you know, uh, an after the fact um, application of fair dealing or, of, or, fair use, or fair use provision. So I agree that we need, uh, more certainty regarding whether we could actually engage in text and data mining activities, activities. We could actually reproduce these works. We could actually circumvent this, uh, this, this style logs rather than wait until, say, the Supreme Court uh, decides on whether we can do it. And the Supreme Court would make that decision within a particular context that may not, not again, provide as much generalization for uh, the use of this. Um, works in other context. So I'll stop there and, and I'll ask the questions. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Faith. And there's been a, a, a few questions, uh, I think also picking up on what uh, Professor Kijiji uh, said. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, for dealings, uh, for dealing in the US, uh, no, in Canada, for youth uh, in the US might serve as a defense, but we don't know and we will not know until like both Supreme Court, uh, I think, can uh, offer an, an, interpret an interpretation. Um, so 
what what should we, what should we do should we uh so there is a need for like harmonization of course uh, so like to support innovation we cannot have it contraving a different approaches this is why like over the years especially for copyright trademark patent there's been a, a global uh, uh harmonization but if 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 copyright is not the the right forum to develop such tool which one uh would it be or is it like too complex, and because you know the the you started and and Ruth, you mentioned the um, uh, the the paper that you mentioned. I thought it was like very interesting in like picking up on so many of the the issues with, with the the EU framework. But so yeah, so should we go uh, toward this way and build better maybe uh, exception with a more refined definition of text and data mining, or do we need to go more like on as you say unfair competition on, or or other ways? What could it look like? I know it's kind of ask you to have you crystal ball for the three of you, but it, maybe uh, like to keep the conversation, if you think we need to have such a, an exemption or at least to support, you know, unless unlicensed use of corporate work for, for TDM, what would be the, the best way if you could be like advising those governments? Michael, since I just finished speaking, why don't you start and then I'll jump on after you. Okay, oh, I, I'm, I don't mind doing that. And I, I, well, I'm going to give a bit of a non answer answer, I guess, um, which is to say that that I feel a little bit like the house is about to be burning and we're and the, and and we're going to miss this if our if we're spending our time focused primarily on how do we get greater certainty through a text and data mining exception or some other exception. I think Ruth's comments about the framing as an exception, I think, are really apt, but I think it's it's more than that. I think there is a, a big push right now for more certainty, but it's the opposite kind of certainty. The certainty that we are starting to see a push for is a certainty of payment. Uh, and I think that creates some significant risks. We see it in news, for example, where the same lobbying that took place by uh, Rupert Murdoch in Australia to get to obtain payments for uh, linking to news and we're seeing it playing out in Bill C-18 here in Canada, is now playing out in AI, arguing that if you're using my news as part of your data set, you need to pay. The Authors Guild is looking for uh, changes to the law that will basically stop similarly the use of um, works within these large learning, large learning language models uh, without some form of compensation. So I think we are rapidly moving to a world in which the battle or the at least the political discourse around legal reform is less around how do we facilitate this by providing legal certainty to allow this to take place to, well, if you are going to do this, you're going to have to pay. And I think, uh, and it's not that there's, there's an absolute aversion to payment. I think that this is a, co is a, a complex issue, more complex than um, say the search side, which um, we could identify as 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 you know clear societal benefits in terms of of enhancing access to information and reasons to ensure that that activity could uh, could continue. But I fear that the kinds of concerns that we have with AI will be exacerbated by um, the the kinds of lobbying that we're seeing right now. So if what we see are fewer data sets used because the standard becomes unless you unless you pay it doesn't go into your data set the concerns we have around bias where only certain kinds of information gets included are going to be exacerbated we're going to have less information less ways to teach these systems and what will be in there is the stuff that people either um either they can afford or more likely it'll be stuff that people will want to influence outcomes potentially misinformation type outcomes and otherwise to say, no, no, you can go ahead and use our stuff, no payment required. And what we end up with is I think risks of more information, misinformation coming out of these systems. We also run a risk, I think, of creating a less competitive environment. If it's an environment where we say we've got to pay and we can get into how you even do this when basically you're saying some sort of global collective in which everybody's content is entitled to some sort of compensation. I don't really see how any of that is really workable, but we do know there will be groups that say, hey, we need compensation. If it is only the Googles and the Microsofts and a couple and a handful of other com companies that are in a position to say, we actually don't mind this because we can use our economic power to ensure our future dominance in this space. 
because others simply won't be able to enter into the space. They won't have access to the large language models. I think it would be a terrible outcome uh, for, for both the development of the technology as well as ensuring greater competition. And so I see that, I, so it's not a direct answer, but I do think that the debate around legal certainty for the activities that we're talking about is playing out. It's just not playing out in quite the way that we, I think, envisioned a few years ago. Um, I would just jump in. Um, I've been looking at some of these the questions, and and I think they all they all revolve around, you know, what what do we do now, imperfectly, while we sort of figure out what we might do in the long term more perfectly. So I, I think I want to echo some of uh, Michael's um, concerns that this is playing out now. And there are certain things we ought not to do. We may not know exactly what the best framework is. And with innovation, we rarely do. But we certainly know that there are certain things that we should not bake into the system. So let me just sort of make my priors pretty clear. If we fundamentally believe that text and data mining is something that is an added value to the economy in which we live, that it is necessary for the production of goods and services and the production of knowledge that will enhance human flourishing, and that it is important to permit and facilitate access at a level that will give us the greatest outputs possible. In other words, a very an argument that mirrors our argument for intellectual property, then there's no question that we need to recognize it not as an exception, not as something that is exceptional, that is under certain circumstances, you can do it for so long by so many people, but rather we need to recognize it as a limit to copyright. That framework I think is very different. I think recognizing the copyright law was not designed to permit and to grant a monopoly over basic building blocks, patterns and practices for which we all have a consensus that our societal advancement requires access at an optimal level. We should not be doing it one paper cut at a time. And that is the issue because every time we fight over exceptions, it's not the principle of the exception. Okay, we recognize it. It's actually the contours. How do you design the exception? Who gets access to it? How long does it last? Under what circumstances can you use it? And all of a sudden, what should have been the response as a policy or normative matter actually becomes part of the problem. And that I think we absolutely have to avoid. I also want to say that whatever we do with a regime that recognizes TDM as a limit to copyright, not just as a mere exception, even that's not enough. We still need to have ways for example, in which we address contracts. What if access to the works requires you to agree that you're not going to in fact conduct the kind of large scale computational analysis for which you want access to the work? What do you do with the private ordering of access to the data commons? What do you do with that? And so the idea that we need a public policy that drives the kinds of legal options and legal tools that facilitate access in order for TDM to occur is my larger point, that we're going to need not just one tool, but a number of tools, but we're going to need a policy framework that says that what we're doing is creating an environment in which innovation can meaningfully advance, building on existing knowledge that is out there. And that means, for example, we did this with the idea expression distinction. Nowhere in the world do we allow a copyright owner to obtain monopoly control over an idea, even if it's wrapped up in a contract. Same thing with the limits to the distribution right. If you purchase your physical copy of a book, we don't allow the copyright owner to control what you do with that book in the privacy of your home. Same thing with the need for privacy rights. The reason we had some of the exceptions in the Berne Convention was to protect the right to privacy. Research being in many ways part of an expression of the privacy right. I mean, so there, there is a collage 
of mechanisms that need to work in meaningful balance in order to create an environment for which in which TDM is operating so that we can get the benefit of the advancement um, in scientific research and knowledge um, that we so, I think, uh, uh, favorably uh, want to see. Perfect, thank you. Thank you so much. And I really like the distinction between like an exception and a limitation to copyright. It also like speaks to the interest uh, at, at stake. Um, and and yeah, all the issues about like access, as you mentioned, are like not new in in copyright. Like in in academia, you know this. We know this way too well with the licenses of the database. And one of the attendees was mentioning this uh, in the in the chat. Well, like even document, but like in public domain, have been in public domain, are not publicly accessible, and <laughs> universities are paying like billions of license fees uh, to have access to those. Uh, to those documents and uh, Michael, as you're mentioning, it's also an issue about like bias and misinformation because yes, bias data and like often like data from from the from the north or like misinformation is freely accessible and uh, quality data for research etc is often like behind uh, a paywall. So it's gonna be even it's already an issue, but it's gonna be even a bigger issue uh, if we cannot train LLMs uh, on the uh, on those uh, points. Um, but as well, Faith, did you want to also maybe um, re react uh, on this? Want to make sure that we have all the all the perspectives and, and opinions in, in, the, in the conversations? Yes, thank you. Actually, I, I wanted to go back to a point that I made in the presentation and to get Teresa's guys and the PGD's thoughts on, on that which is uh, something I've seen with um, African countries. African countries are interested in tech and data mining activities, but they are also uh, cautious uh, regarding what the implications of tech and data mining activities could be, especially if it involves mining data that comes from the continent to build technological tools that are not accessible to the continent. So, um, how do you think African countries can address that concern with copyright law even because this conversation is happening within the context of copyright law and saying, okay, if we're going to sex and data mining activities, what can we do within the context of copyright law to ensure that we also reap the benefits of sex and data mining activities and we're not in turn excluded from the benefits or from the goods that could arise from sex and data mining activities? No, and I think you you raise a very good point about like access to to knowledge and data, and also like the the powers uh, at play. And someone in the in the Q and A was also you know explaining that some uh, big corporations who have access, like such as Universal, you know, like managing catalogs and stuff, they they can develop digital logs to impede on like you know people ability to do text and and data mining in the catalog. You have, as Ruth was mentioning, like big contracts or like basically uh, even though that would be maybe for use you know under corporate framework it would still be like you know an infringement on your on the contract and the term and conditions so you still cannot cannot do it and uh during that time there is also like those big corporations in the north who could just like access all of the knowledge and extract uh, knowledge from majority world, and we've seen the, those issues before with traditional knowledge and induced knowledge. So I think this is also something to like keep in mind and making sure there is a, a global conversation uh, for for this. And and do you think that maybe uh, we we need to have a, a new uh, WIPO uh, treaty, or should it be like a WTO treaty, or like no we? <laughs> We're done with the treaties. We need more like a collaboration be between the states, uh, or is it like a per or there like room for international uh, collaboration? And I know that the three of you have been like very involved in international, you know, negotiation and conversation. So I would love to have like you know your your thoughts on this. In terms of an international treaty, I don't see us getting an international treaty on our text and data mining rights now. And also not even at the 
think that we really need the response to the text and data mining issue because when the issue of text and data mining came up at the last SCR, the African group wanted to make it uh, a point, a, a point in the work program that, that would be addressed by the SCR. But there were objections even relating to, you know, just having conversations relating to limitations and exceptions for text and data mining activity that they add to uh, concede to using the word may, that we may have conversations related to text and data mining activity. So even to, have, to start that conversation at the international level, it's already been contentious, not to talk of reaching, reaching a consensus that would press an international treaty on, on that subject. We are still in the process of you know, pressing an international treaty on exceptions and limitations for education and, and library uh, uses, which are issues that have, you know, protected copyright law for decades now. And so the issue of text and data mining may not get as much as attention. And even if it does, uh, it may not get as quickly as we want um, it to get it uh, at the international, whether at WIPO or at the WTO. Yeah, if if I can follow with follow up on that, I think I think that, that was a really good intervention. I I must admit, I, you know, I, I think the fallback invariably is to talk about this from a global perspective, and it's 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 obvious that there's a need to take that into account. There, there was a recent letter published by a number of uh, AI pioneers and others calling for this sort of halt of ChatGPT for now and ChatGPT four. And one of the responses that we've seen from particularly people in the sector is to say that. If if all you do is stop what takes place within um, the the within democracies or within you know the countries that are willing to to go along and basically cede the field to certain other countries that may not be willing to to play along that may not be as democratic that raises some real concerns about um, the evolution globally of where AI, AI heads. Um, so I think there is a need for that for for the, these global discussions. I guess part of my question would be whether or not, and this kind of builds on Ruth's point about the, the the frustration of framing so much of this around an exception. More broadly, whether or not this is, you know, we should be looking at these issues through primarily a copyright lens. Which, if we did this at, at WIPO, presumably that's what we would be doing. And while I know, of course, that the TDMs are exactly that, to me, this issue is so inextricably linked to. Um, the other elements when we talk about AI policy, whether that's around some of the biases that that can arise and the human rights related issues that come out of AI, the competition related issues. I mean, there's just there's so many factors that come into uh, a discussion around AI regulation that the that that sort of the using copyright as the prism for trying to address some of these issues strikes me as probably pretty problematic, not just because I think that that user public interest sometimes um, gets sort of tripped in some of these fora when it comes to, to copyright, despite the best efforts of people like Ruth and others to try to ensure that those those views are, are, are well represented. So, you know, I do think there there is, I think there is an opportunity now. I mean, quite frankly, I think greater certainty is the sort of thing that could be traded as part of an effort to try to develop these systems for greater algorithmic transparency, stronger commitments around bias, um, around the kinds of things that we want to see to to create some of the safeguards around AI, and part of the the value exchange within that regulatory framework might well be greater certainty around access to the large language models. But we need to be looking at these issues, I think, in a somewhat more holistic fashion that we that we bring in many of these different issues. And I'm not sure that we've got an ideal for at this stage to to deal with those questions. But it seems to me that's where the discussion has to go. Let me just say really quickly, because I know our time is um, wrapping up here, but um, one, something to think about is that AI is a general use technology and you always regulate general use technologies quite differently. Um, think of the radio, for example, um, and think of the way we have handled platforms. Um, so when I mentioned sui generis treatment, it's because we need to understand this data economy as functioning in a very different way or the potential to function in a very different way if we regulate it differently. So AI policy is not gonna be one policy. It's gonna be multiple policies, AI in medicines, AI in law, 
AI in copyright, AI in art, AI, you know, in road construction, it will look very different. And the modalities for liability will look different. The incentive structures will look different. My challenge is that we need to be asking, what can we do differently so that we don't re replicate the problems that we've had with the DMCA, with duration, with monopoly use, misuse of, um, of these technologies that are governed by multiple legal regimes. Um, Wendy Gordon and I were talking recently and, and she mentioned something that I thought was, that I've been thinking about and that is just saying something is in the public domain isn't enough because you can always recapture it with technological protection measures, with contracts, with all sorts of different things. Um, and so we need to think about even the public domain. What does it look like to say that something is in a public domain when you have a technology that is cap that has the potential to capture the public domain and essentially regenerate it so that it's no longer the public domain? And so our policy priorities need to be clear. And I don't think we need to look for a uniform policy to address um, the possibilities that AI presents and the challenges that we have to overcome with it. Perfect, thank you, thank you so much. And yeah, as you mentioned, the issue also like, what is the, the legal framework and the regime of the output of those systems, especially if we allow uh, um, uh, a full like, you know, uh, free for all that text and data mining is, is another question. But maybe as a, as a last question to, to the three of you, because we have been discussing, you know, many uh, interest at stay at, at, at stake, sorry, uh, issue of like power, payments, money, etc. Uh, so when we discuss, you know, if we imagine maybe building a new framework that would be more on like data, not just copyright, not just privacy, but like, you know, but data as a limitation to copyright framework, to maybe privacy framework, etc. So when we're discussing barrier to innovation, protecting the authors, protecting the privacy of people, so like so many things are at stake, who should be uh, around the, the table then? Uh, do we need, yeah, I know it's like the very complex question for, for the end, I'm, I'm sorry for this, but like in a perfect world, let's dream for, for maybe a few seconds uh, to, to end uh, this conversation on like a, a lovely note. Uh, how could we make this happen? if you had like the, the power to make this happen. I mean, I would say pretty much everyone should be at the table, um, authors of works that are included in data sets should be at the table, people generating data sets should be at the table. Uh, people whose data being used uh, are being included in data sets, which are like you and me, everyone um, should be represented at the table. Users of um, data sets should be represented at the table. Persons who would be implicated, who would be affected by the use of the, such data sets should be represented at, at the table. And um, technologists, should be represented at the table. Everyone is affected by all of these issues and uh, their perspectives are valid, their perspectives are important and we should be represented at the table. Ruth, Michael, the last one. Well, I agree with, I mean, certainly, I face right. It, it, it's clear these issues uh, have such broad applicability and touch on so many issues. Ruth noted, you know, AI for 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 the met for health is is different than AI in some other spaces, but all of this is is part of that kind of dialogue that you're searching for. It seems to me part of the starting point is to identify, you know, where it is where is it that we want to go with this. I mean, it, it helps if you're trying to set out on a journey. In this case, on a policy journey, you know, what what is the goal? And uh, I'm not sure that we've that we've sort of come to grips at this stage fully with that. You know, I, I know I have my own view that 
the take that is a somewhat more optimistic take on AI that I think this is truly transformative in some incredibly exciting ways. And our challenge is to develop some of the safeguards and guardrails to ensure that we go in eyes open, but recognizing that there's some real opportunities there. And if, if that's the driving or animating force behind this, well, then, uh, then we start having conversations around policies that allow both the, the de both the development of these technologies in a manner that, that preserves equity, addresses bias, um, and the like. Uh, but let's recognize not everybody I mean, co would come to that proverbial large global table um, with that same objective. And I think part of the discussion needs to be around, uh, you know, what, what, where are we, where are we headed here? And it, and I think recognizing that, that both between sectors they may there may be different perspectives. Between countries there may be different perspectives, depending on where they even sit um, in the on the development of AI and whether or not they see sort of more direct, say, economic benefit or other societal benefits, or what they see are risks and being left behind, and therefore some of the their priorities are going to differ. Since I have the last word, I'm, I'm just going to say two things. One is um, I don't think there's one table. And I think we should avoid that mistake. Um, I'm not sure that copyright lawyers should be speaking to the application of AI technologies in the medical space and, and what that regulation should look like and what it should look like in the global south versus the global west. I, I think there are multiple tables. And what I'm hopeful we will find um are opportunities for even non-interested parties to be at the table we, we we start designing regulation with this fundamental flaw consistently in ip and that is to assume that the innovator always stays the innovator and the user always stays the user but we know that number one they're both one and the same often and that they switch in a dynamic fashion and so it's vital for all of us to ensure that the faces at the table represent different uh, positions within the ecosystem of, of innovation and creativity. So that's, I think there are many tables and I think we should be intentional about creating many tables um, and ensuring that we're getting even the adversarial perspective Right, so that we're making sure that the policies we make are policies that are robust. Um, last comment I would make is that I also think that we need an institution. Um, AI is general purpose technology. You know, the text and data mining and the things that we want to encourage in order to generate more data are all about fueling the production of these productive assets. So my view is you need something like the Food and Drug Administration, like some, some an agency that is responsible for advancing the policy dialogue, but ensuring that the outputs are safe enough, not without risk, but safe enough that they don't undo our democratic, political, and legal intuitions about what it means to live in a society that is flourishing. So I, I don't think it's just negotiations between interested parties and, and everyone whose perspective matters. I think we do need a, an institutional anchor that can help facilitate um, the work that needs to be ongoing about what makes for a productive um, society in which data and text mining and artificial intelligence and computing models all function um, in a way that ensures that our basic civil and political and legal um, 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 virtues are kept and preserved. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the three of you for this uh, amazing conversation. I know that people have been also very engaged uh, online. So thank you for, for the participants, for all, all the all the questions I hope we've been able to uh, to unpack and maybe clarify a, a few points for 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 you all. Uh, but I'm sure you're ending up this question with even maybe more, more questions. Uh, but I hope also like some some answers and a, a new new perspective. So thank you uh, all. And because people have been asking in, in the chat, I will just uh, confirm that yes, this was this was recorded. We might like do a few uh, edits. 
uh, for some of the technical uh, glitch and then the video will be made available uh, on, on YouTube and we'll send it to, to all of you. And um, a few attendees have been asking about maybe some uh, additional readings of some of the scholarship that the three of you would have uh, committed on, on the topic. So maybe we will try to uh, create a kind of like a reference list for people who want to, to learn more uh, about this and we will send this to all people who have uh, signed up for, for the event. So again, Thank you so much, Faith, Michael, and, and Ruth for, for joining us uh, today. I think this was a fantastic uh, conversation. And I'm sure it's just the, the first of a series of uh, global conversation on the topic. So thank you again, and I have you all a lovely rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.